uh, at the outset, I'll be thankful to uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu and the whole team for inviting me to this uh, August gathering, to this August conference. So after this diabetes and bone, I'm going to discuss the interaction between diabetes and thyroid. So if you see the thyroid disorders and diabetes, they are probably the two most common endocrinopathies which we classically see in the clinical practice and they frequently coexist. And if you see the prevalence of thyroid dysfunction in diabetes, it's much, much higher in comparison to the general population. And you will see the overall prevalence is 13.4% of thyroid disorders in the diabetes. And if you compare as a sex-wise, probably female are much more higher incidence in comparison to the male. Female having almost close to 32%, whereas in the male it is 6 to 7%. So that shows that is probably some sort of link or association with in the, between diabetes and thyroid. So let us see the both the axis. If someone is having a poor glycemic control, it mimic hyperthyroidism. Reason is there will be fatigue, there will be increased appetite, there will be weight loss. So these are the symptoms which might mimic like a thyrotoxicosis. In the other way, if someone is having a diabetic nephropathy, they might mimic like a mixed edema. That means there will be edema, fatigue, pallor, weight gain, all those things. They might confuse with particularly mixed edema. So in the clinical picture point of view also, there will be some sort of confusion between two drugs. So with this background, we will discuss the topic with prevalence of thyroid dysfunction among the diabetes. What is the risk thyroid toxicosis and diabetes, then hypothyroidism in the diabetes, then what are the effects of drugs, then pregnancy related things, then we'll discuss some of the guidelines. Let us discuss about the prevalence of thyroid dysfunction. You will see the diabetes and hypothyroidism, there are the strengths, bedfellows or mutual companion. They coexist among each other together. These are the prevalence data from the thyroid disorders. If you will see the general population, it is 6.6 percent, whereas among the diabetic population, it is ranging from 10.8 to 13.4 percent. So, in diabetic, the hypothyroid risk is high. Again, if you will see the meta-analysis, close to 11,000 patients. It is 11 percent frequency among the thyroid disorders. This is, if you will see the hypothyroidism, then again, it is 3 to 6 percent, 3 to 6 percent. If you will see the subclinical hypothyroidism, it is 5 to 13 percent. Again, postpartum thyroiditis is also much higher range and uh, hyperthyroidism again is actually 0.1% in the general population among the diabetes it is 1 to 2% again still higher in comparison to the general population. And this is the uh, type 1 diabetes you will see among the female it is close to 30% people are having hypothyroid among the male it is 10% if you take the total it is close to 20% that means even if in type 1 and type 2 both are having increased risk of thyroid disorders. And this is a study particularly from the, our Indian, some of the studies, where actually if you see the overall population and among these, what are the thyroid dysfunctions, probably everywhere, hypothyroid is much more higher frequency in comparison to the hyperthyroid, but still both hyper and hypothyroid is found to be significantly higher in the diabetes in comparison to the general population. So you see, these are the, some of the Indian studies, what I have discussed here. Again, this is, if you think about the autoimmune thyroid disorders among type 1 diabetes in the India. There is actually, there is one study from our Odisha, Sunil has actually having a sample size of 260, whereas hypothyroid is found 28% and hyper is 1.5%. And there are another two studies which has again shown significantly higher range. So, autoimmune thyroiditis is also found to be significantly high in type 1 diabetes in comparison to the type 1 diabetes. We have a lot of studies, particularly specifically in the autoimmune thyroiditis in specifically taking close to more than 52,000 type 1 diabetes patients. These are the studies which has clearly shown that particularly in type 1 diabetes, the autoimmune thyroiditis is significantly high in comparison to the general population. In some of the studies have shown as high as up to 40 percent. So the prevalence of autoimmune thyroiditis in type 1 diabetes, if you see, the percentage of thyroid antibodies, it varies from the different population, geographical, different geographical ranges. So in the different geographical region, if you see it varies from 2.5 to 32 percent. Overt hypothyroidism is uh, ranges up to 0 to 15 percent. Subclinical hypothyroidism between 1 to 11 percent. Clinical hyperthyroidism, it is 0.07 to 9.3 percent. And if you take in total autoimmune thyroiditis, it is 3.9 to 24 percent. That means if, whether it take subclinical hypothyroidism, Hyper, overt hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, both are found to be significantly high in type 1 diabetes patients. And if you see, want to see what are the particular antibodies, if you see different antibodies, 
if these are the ICA, GAT 65, IA2, IAA, these are the certain antibodies we classically do in type 1 diabetes. You see, the people see the prevalence among the grapes or autoimmune thyroiditis, it is found to everywhere, it is found to be significantly high. So that means all those antibodies you will get significantly high. In the reverse, way, if you try to see the anti TP antibody, anti thyroglobulin antibodies, which are the classically autoimmune thyroiditis markers, they also found to be significantly high in type 1 diabetes. That means both ways, these actually autoimmune markers has been found to be together, whether take type 1 diabetes, found to be having higher anti markers of TP1 uh, anti thyroglobulin antibodies. You will say type 1 diabetes markers like ICH, GAT, and GAT 65, IA2, IAA, all are found to be significantly high in autoimmune thyroiditis patients. So what is the link? There are certain links which have been actually found in type 1 diabetes and autoimmune thyroiditis. The, there are few common susceptible genes has been actually uh, described. This is HLA-DR3, CTLA-4, and this is PTPN-22, and also FOXP3 and AIRE gene. These are the certain genes which has been actually found. Though makes the link together or there is the link between type 1 diabetes and autoimmune thyroiditis. However, this is not true for type 2 diabetes because in type 2 diabetes, specifically genetic link has not been well described. But however, there is actually few studies which are so genetic polymorphism of particularly diadonous type 2 is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So these are some of the association, but actually in type 2 diabetes, it is not clearly mentioned. And of course, Increase age is one of the factor which makes these two things actually combined together or placing together in particular clinical practice. Then coming to the thyrotoxicosis and diabetes, these are the different prevalences types in thyrotoxicosis, but they have taken both type 1 and type 2 together. All are shown actually significantly higher risk of thyrotoxicosis in diabetes population. And what is the basic mechanism? There is increased hepatic glucose output which was there is acting on the hepatic glot to gly glycogenesis. There is increased GI glucose absorption. There is reduced half-life of insulin because insulin clearance is actually accelerated in thyrotoxicosis. The insulin release of insulin precursors or biological inactive insulin release is more. And also there are some counter-regulatory hormones are released like growth hormone, glucagon, catecholamines, which makes the as a particular blood glucose increase the blood glucose and there occurs apoptosis of the beta cells. These are the certain reasons why thyrotoxicosis we have altered the particularly homeostasis of the glucose homeostasis. So there is, again, if there is thyrotoxicosis in diabetes combined together, there are certain diagnostic confusion like there is uncertain to interpret thyroid function test. There occurs low thyroid hormone levels due to the acute hyperglycemic state because there occurs a sick euthyroid symptom like syndromes. So sometimes it is very difficult to interpret the thyroid function test. Again, the poor glycemic control, hyperthyroidism, and also they can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis. There occurs a hypermetabolic features of thyrotoxicosis and typical osmotic pictures of hyperglycemia. Again, when they combine together, probably it is uh, makes sometimes confusion for the diagnosis. And sometimes another important thing is thyroid storm is getting masked when there is acute severe hyperglycemia. So there is some sort of diagnostic confusion if both the things remaining together. Again, another important part is ophthalmopathy and diabetes, you will see the in incidence of particularly this thyroid optic neuropathy resulting blindness is found to be significantly high in diabetic patients in comparison to the non-diabetic population. It is 33% versus only 4%. That means the diabetic ophthalmopathy, sorry, thyrotoxic ophthalmopathy is significantly higher among the diabetic population. And again, the risk of blindness is found to be significantly high. Then coming to the another important part from the treatment point of view, if someone is using thyroidolidin, probably you have to be careful because we know the thyroidolidins they have some sort of particularly retention of water and that sometimes be detrimental for particularly ophthalmopathy patients. So one should keep in mind or that if you are using thyroid, uh, thyroidolidin group of drugs, particularly biogritazin, probably you have to keep a little bit um, uh, caution about using ophthalmopathy. Then coming to the hypothyroidism and diabetes, again if you see the pathophysiology, that is occurs reduced glucose induced insulin secretion, there occurs decrease like neoglucogenesis, decreased hepatic glucose output, there occurs increased insulin resistance, there occurs reduced clearance of endogenous and exogenous insulin. Again, hypothyroid itself can cause reduced appetite with decreased food intake. So both the ways actually has actually link or with particularly hypothyroidism. Again, hypothyroid has some effect on the complications of diabetes also because you know hypothyroid instead increases the risk of cardiovascularis. So due to dyslipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance, all those things combined together the severe risk increases. There occurs increased risk of 
uh, occurrence of nephropathy and retinopathy in hypothyroid patients. There occurs muscle wasting and that weakness is aggravated. Hypothyroid itself is an immunosuppressive state. Again, we know diabetes itself immunosuppressive state, so both combined together, risk of infection increases. The risk of hypoglycemia is higher in hypothyroid patients and also the counter regulated response to hypoglycemia is also getting suppressed in hypothyroid patients. So if someone, a diabetic patient developing hypoglycemia, probably the hypoglycemia induced damage will be more in hypothyroid patients in comparison to a euthyroid patient. So this is the link what actually with particularly among the thyroid disorders. So what are the clinical effects? There will be some sort of hair disorders, that is excessive aggravated hair loss if combined together. There occurs worsening of the pulmonary functors, more sleep apnea will be there if both diabetes and hypothyroid together. Again, cardiovascular point of view I have discussed. Then again, exercise intolerance and fatigue will be more if particularly diabetes and thyroid is com hypothyroid is combined together. So in both the ways, if you see there is combination is more detrimental for complication point of view. Then what are the effect on the drugs? We know that metformin is a drug classically used in every diabetic already our previous speakers discussed that what is the effect of metformin on thyroid it reduces the TSH level in hypothyroid primary hypothyroid independent of replacement of thyroid so mechanism is it inhibits MAP kinase in hypothalamus also enhance the inhibitory modulation of particular thyroid hormone on hypothalamus so if someone is on hypothyroid only thyroid replacement another person on thyroid plus metformin, probably the TSH response or TSH will be better controlled in thyroid and metformin group in comparison to the uh, uh, only uh, thyroid replacement. I am not telling that every hypothyroid patient should be given metformin, not like that. If someone is diabetes and thyroid coexist, if you are giving combined together, the TSH response will be better and that response is not there in euthyroid patient. That means if you are giving metformin to a euthyroid person, probably the TSH will be not significantly altered, it will be same. So I will show the uh, study. So there are, of course, another important thing is if someone is having not nodule, thyroid hypo metformin use itself causes reduction in the nodule size and there are also association of higher remission rate in diabetes with differential thyroid carcinoma. This is the study which has clearly shown after one year of metformin therapy, there occurs a significant TSH decrease which observed in the diabetic patients with hypothyroid in comparison to untreated patients, but there was no significant change in pre T4 was observed. Only TSH effect is on the TSH, no effect on the pre T4. And also they found there is a 30 percent shrinkage in the nodule size with use of this particularly metformin in hypothyroid patients. So in both the ways, actually it is getting benefit or giving benefit to the hypothyroid patients. Let us see sulfonylurea and glitazones. Both reduces iodine uptake and gortrogen effect on the first generation sulfonylurea. But in the second generation or new generation sulfonylurea, it has no effect. Also, similar observation was found with some of the people of the glycolazide. However, sulfonylurea is not contraindicated in hypothyroid patients or thyroid disorders. And already I have discussed the thyroid orbitopathy or particularly ophthalmopathy will be get exaggerated with particularly use of glitazones. Then again, the infrequent biometrics. And we know that particularly the thyroid C cell hyperplasia, we know with particularly all GLP-1 analogs. Hence, GLP-1 shift agonists are not recommended in persons with family history of medullary carcinoma of thyroid or main type 2. So that means, for the particularly in the GLP-1 point of view, this is the thing should keep in mind. And effect on the statins, again, we know that statin-induced myopathy is one of the thing. Itself, hypothyroid can cause myopathy. So, if you are using statin, probably going to the very high dose is actually is should be very much careful or you should keep be, be vigilant that if someone is developing myopathy probably you have to reduce the dose of the statins point of view again this is the in the reverse way if you are using levothyroxine replacement what is happening to the diabetic status you see so this is the left one as actually in the first two is pre-diabetic and second two is diabetic patients that pre-diabetic first one is not treated thyroid second one is treated with thyroid that is significant improvement in the hg1c Similarly, among the diabetic patients, 3 and 4, that has again shows among the diabetic patients that those who are on thyroid replacement, there is actually significant improvement in the HB1C in comparison to those not on replacement. Again, this is the analysis of fasting glucose and postmedial in the patients before and after replacement. You see, there is a significant, with, this is with therapy, this is without therapy. So that shows again both fasting and PPE is less in with replacement of thyroid itself, which is independent of other factors. So, 
in diabetic it hypothyroid is there and replacing thyroid itself helps in the reduction in the blood glucose level in the hypothyroid patients among the effect of the antithyroid drugs glucose control usually improves return to euthyroid state and beta blocker sometimes masking the warning symptom of hypoglycemia one should keep in mind when you are using the beta blocker then coming to the pregnancy part there is of course moderate increased risk of gdm among the thyroid disorders there is three time increased risk of thyroid disorders in gdm so in both the ways if someone is having hypothyroid the risk of gdm is little bit high but if someone is having gdm probably the risk of thyroid is increasing by three times and there is 25% women in type 1 diabetes sometimes develop postpartum thyroiditis so that means also keep in mind that type 1 diabetic patients are much more prone to develop postpartum thyroiditis so combined gdm and hypothyroid that is together probably that increase risk of comorbidities like in the risk of cs increases preterm delivery is high and also hypertensive disorders in the pregnancy is found to be high in the, both the diabetes and thyroid coexist in the pregnancy part and what is if you are translating the clinical practice probably the tsh and tpo antibodies should be determined in each type 1 diabetic women planning for pregnancy and women in type 1 diabetes with tpo positive tsh at least should be checked in 3 months 6 months and 12 months and all screen, screening for gdm if tsh is high again if someone is in hypothyroid they screen gdm screening should be done early in comparison to the normal population what we classically tell for at least at the if not coming from the first visit at least at the 16 week at least first Um, screening should be done in those group of patients so there are certain actually association or studies between thyroid carcinoma and diabetes but the there is actually the causal relationship is not established so there is lack of overall association of thyroid carcinoma in most of the studies coming to the practical recommendation so what is we recommend the screening in type 1 thyroid disorders in type 1 diabetes in every type 1 diabetes t3 t4 tsh tp antibody should be done but whether you can go for anti tg antibody is not required so it is optional for every patient if tsh and tp antibody is normal every year it should be repeated if tp antibody is positive every 6 month it should be repeated and if someone has in agwe impaired linear growth goiter or hypothyroid symptoms probably they should be actually the um, thyroid tsh should be repeated much more frequently as, as the clinician can take a call in that part what are the guidelines is telling this is ata guideline patient should diabetes may require more frequent testing in type 2 diabetes after 35 years and every five years should be done then s guidelines similarly pal palpation and tsh should be done no, that is what they have not given any specific guideline for diabetes s guideline not specifically mentioned but thyroid function in pregnant women with diabetes is should be done or recommended and ada 2019 guideline not specifically mentioned but any thyroid uh, diabetes with diabetes is there tsh should be repeated every yearly for particularly more than 50 years and if dyslipidemia is there again it should be early or should be done much more frequently so the suggested algorithm all patients with diabetes a baseline evaluation of tsh and tpo should be done if patient is u thyroid and type 1 annual tsh is required if in type 2 you see tsh less than 2 probably 3 to 5 per is okay more than 2 then annual tsh is okay if there is over hypothyroidism that treatment is required in soft clinical hypothyroidism then you see the bmd atrial fibrillation tp antibody positive or tsh more than 10 if these are the there probably you can use or you can treat those group of patients so summarizing my topic thyroid disorders both overt and soft clinical are quite frequent among the diabetes all diabetic patients should be screened with particularly baseline thyroid dysfunctions metformin and tsh that would might be a innovative therapy for thyroid proliferative disorders there is increased risk of diabetic complications like nephropathy retinopathy and neuropathy in thyroid disorders recognizing and promptly treating those might correct both the ways both thyroid can be controlled and diabetes can be well managed use of levothyroxine to treat soft clinical hypothyroidism with tsh more than 4.5 might prevent later complications of the diabetes thank you